welcome to the show. We got a fun one today. We'll be talking about one of my favorite bands of all time, Guns N' Roses. And uh, since Axel and Slash were not available, I got the next best thing. We got Brando, who does a GNR based podcast called Appetite for Distortion. And I also welcome back author Christopher P. Hilton, who wrote the book, uh, The Rise, what is it, The Rise, Fall, Rebirth of Hair Metal. Got it right here. Uh, two great guests, and we have a ton of great GNR facts, stories, and opinions on this episode. We're going to go through each album and the timeline of the band, and at the end, we'll give our rankings. So it was a lot of fun. Check it out. Well, welcome to the Chuck Shoot Podcast. We have uh, Christopher Hilton, author. How are you doing? Welcome back, Chris. Hey, Chuck. Thanks for having me back on. Glad to be here. Yeah, and uh, for the first time on the show, Brando from the Appetite for Distortion podcast. How are you doing, Brando? I'm doing well. I appreciate you asking me to and having me on. Yeah, thanks for coming on. So well, let's just dive right in. So we're going to go through and kind of break down each album and kind of era. And uh, we'll just, you know, throw in some stories, some opinions, some trivia, and uh, and we'll just go right through it. So uh, early days, the, the I think most people know the story of how the, the name came together. It was Hollywood Rose and L.A. Guns. Combine the two, and you got Guns and Roses. But I didn't. Did you guys know that the they were once considering the band calling the band AIDS and uh, Heads of Amazon? I actually just read that a couple days ago. Yeah, me too. <laughs> did you know that, Brando? How do I not know that? I I, yeah, I don't know. No, I gotta go. I gotta go. I'd rather <laughs> embarrass myself. I'm not gonna pretend that I know that they were gonna be called AIDS. Isn't that? A, I mean, that's just fast. I've heard like, Axel. I've heard the name Axel. I'll have to confirm that with. You know, I'm going to text him now and see if he responds. Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to, I never do that. I feel like the dude. Who are you going to text? Uh, Doug Goldstein, the former manager. Okay. okay. Yeah. So he then wasn't they, around in the early days, but maybe he'll know. Yeah. So the then. One thing I didn't know is I knew they combined the name Guns N' Roses, but I didn't know their original plan was to have that be the record label title. And they were just going to issue singles under this record label Guns N' Roses. I didn't know that until probably about a week ago. I don't remember where I read it. Okay. Yeah. And then, so, but they, they ended up calling it Appetite for Destruction and then Obviously, the original artwork, which is on the inside of the album, was that lady being raped by the robot. Or I mean, that was like, yeah, you can't put this in Walmart. So they had to change the uh, album cover. That was kind of a big yeah. opinion. Yeah, I mean, the rumor was that they, they did that on purpose just for publicity. I and mean, I don't know. I haven't read too much about it, but that they knew when they had that second cover in the can the whole time. Oh, that makes well, sense. I love that, that artist, the, the painting, uh, the painter, was it Robert, uh, Robert Williams, I believe? That sounds familiar, yeah. yeah. Yeah, okay. He was, he was a fan of him, and I don't know. That's what that's what he wanted. <laughs> yeah, it, it's kind of it's interesting. I don't think it's uh, socially appropriate now, but it was like when when you're a kid and you you open that up and you see like a boob, you're like, oh, what is this? This is crazy. So, but then the album, obviously, the music itself. I mean, this is classic. I think we're all gonna we're, we're gonna rank it at the end, but I'm sure we all have this as number one. I mean, this is lightning in a bottle here. All the songs are great. I think my favorite is Night Train, just because it's kind of a little bit not overplayed, but still one of the greatest songs. What are your highlights from from the album, guys? Uh, you, you had, it's Night Train too. I remember thinking, you know, that wasn't a, a growing up in just listening to Dresser Radio. That's how classic rock uh, made its impression on me. Being, I don't know how old you guys are. I'm, I may be a little younger. Uh, Thirty-seven? Are you like? I don't know. I'm a little anyway. older. Yeah, you're a little younger. Okay. A little older for me. So I just to experience that and just when I first got Appetite, I just remember the first song I heard that wasn't a radio single that I wasn't familiar with was Night Train. And that has just stuck with me throughout all these years. And that and uh, Rocket Queen and Mr. You know, they all they all stick. Like you, you said at the beginning, it's it's a flawless record. I, for me, there are or songs maybe I like more than others mm -hmm. in different parts of my life, but it's I never disliked a song on it. Mm -hmm. You agree with that, Chris? It's I mean, it's every song's good, right? Is there anything that you didn't like? I mean, you've read my book. You know, I'm a huge music fan and a huge fan of the genre, and uh, you know, it's my favorite album of all time. Uh, and honestly, it's not even that close, right? I mean, I think it flawless is probably the perfect word. You know, there are very few albums that you can go front to back. And you don't get the urge to skip a single song. Uh, and I think Appetite for Destruction personifies that better than almost anything out there. I mean, any one of those songs, uh, you know, stands on its own. Uh, for me, I always had a soft spot for Think About You. Uh, hmm. I always thought it had a, a melody, uh, you know, that was not necessarily present on all the other songs, you know, kind of an outlier, especially in terms of the, the you know, you might say emotion of the lyrical content. 
Uh, but no, everyone's a winner for sure. You know, I was, I think I was telling Chuck the last time we spoke, uh, I don't have a lot of childhood memories that I, I recall clearly, but I will never forget the first time I heard uh, the start of Welcome to the Jungle. I mean, it was just like nothing I had ever heard before. Uh, right. It was, it was all downhill for me after that, for sure. But no, it, it's the perfect album, in my opinion. Do you guys get sick of the, like the more radio hits though, like Sweet Child of Mine? Like, cause you just heard them. So, I mean, they're good songs, but you've heard them so many times. Not on that record. Okay. Not on that record, but yeah. yeah. Uh, just having, especially just working in radio and it's, it's sometimes it's a blessing and a curse because mm-hmm. you would hear the same songs more than you hear the same songs. Right. So that's why I know over the years that Gene R stands the test of time for me because I'm not really sick of them other than I can do without uh, Live and Let Die and Knock on the Heaven's Door. Like, I, I don't need to hear that every time. So okay. I love those songs, but for me, just, I don't know. Maybe that's radio's fault. Yeah. I don't blame, I don't blame it, DNR for that. Well, it's it, definitely a thing, right? I mean, I hear people talk about Van Halen's 1984 album all the time, and they can't say enough about uh, House of Pain or Girl Gone Bad. And you get it a lot because songs like Jump in Panama are just so overplayed. But you wondered, had House of Pain and Girl Gone Bad been released as a singles, would yeah. we be saying the same thing about Jump in Panama? Right. Uh, and sometimes, I mean, Paradise City, I've just heard so many times, but I agree with Brandon. I mean, I'm never going to change the channel if a Guns N' Roses song comes on. Never going to happen. That's awesome. Yeah, it's interesting, though. The first single off that album, probably, I don't know if a lot of people know this, but it was actually It's So Easy, and they made a video for it, and it uh, it was banned from MTV, of course. But I didn't know this story. I just read this today that David Bowie was on the set, and uh, he was he got he had a few too many drinks, and he was hitting on Axel's girlfriend. Axel punched him in the face. Yeah, and chased him out of the, the cat house. <laughs> That's crazy. But I guess they made up and then they went drinking later. So crazy story. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, people don't realize that it's so easy. It was the first time. What a bizarre choice for the first single, right? First of all, it was only released formally as a single in the UK. I think they spent $150,000 on a video that included such violent images. MTV was never going to play it. Uh, it, It's a a song that's slightly anomalous to the others on the album. And that actually starts with this, this very low register type of vocal, right? Uh, Just bizarre choice for first single. I mean, yeah. people don't realize, Chuck, I think you and I were talking about it last time as well. This album sat out there for almost a, a full year before it went to number one. It was months after that. I think it was it was released in, it was June or July, I think, if I remember right. Uh, it wasn't until October uh, that Welcome to the Jungle even got picked up and played on MTV at that, you know, 4 a.m. Sunday slot that started the album taking off. And it wasn't really until, I think, Sweet Child of Mine really broke on MTV in the summer of, uh, I think it was 88 that the album made it to number one. So I mean, in revisionist history, you think, ah, oh, you know, this is one of the biggest album albums of all time. But right. I mean, it, they almost brought the band back and said, hey, they, we're done with this album. Go make another one uh, before it even got a chance to take off. I mean, that, that wouldn't happen in today's world. No. So when did it, when did that, uh, was it Welcome to the Jungle that was on the Dirty Harry soundtrack? Was that around the, the, that was kind of part of the way that it kind of broke too, right? Didn't that help give it a boost? That was- that was earlier, if I remember. Okay. Right. Jungle actually got re-released as a single after oh, Sweet Child of Mine. Okay. Huh. Interesting. All right. Well, obviously that was a huge one, and then but the GNR lies. So that was kind of like they just took this old suicide live, like a suicide EP. That I guess it actually wasn't recorded live, but they made it sound like it was live. And then uh, I didn't know this that Paul Stanley would he want to produce this EP or was it Appetite? But he wanted to rewrite a couple of the songs, and so they said no, no thanks. That's kind of interesting that he was involved. I didn't have no idea he had, he was involved in Guns N' Roses. It was Appetite, if I remember right. He wanted to rewrite uh, Jungle. Hmm. Yeah, I believe it was Appetite as well. But okay. Just, there are a lot of people who also passed on them because they were just that out of it. They were that crazy. There were people who were dealing with Motley Crue that said, I don't want to deal with <laughs> Guns N' Roses. That's funny. You know, so they were passed on time and time again. And, you know, sometimes, it's, yeah, it took a while for Welcome. And thankfully, you know, Sweet Child hit. You know, that was what really helped them and break them. And it's something else that's uh, odd. And Christopher, you probably noticed this, especially now with what we call hair metal, which uh, I, I have no problem with the term. But things uh, are more popular overseas than they are here first or last. Like It, it just depends. So, hmm. you know, uh, GNR may have broken in the UK first before you know, the US was hip to it, you know, yeah. kind of thing. It took Sweet Child, though, for them to get worldwide, you know, fame. And I tweeted it out today. They didn't even think that wasn't planned. Like, it still boggles my mind that it took a year for this album. 
the break. Like, right. The album we're still talking about. We're not talking about, you know, Menudo. We're talking <laughs> about Guns N' Roses, Alpha Type of Destruction. We're talking like a real stand the test of time album that took a year. I mean, the strange oh, thing was, if you remember, I mean, Hysteria took almost the same amount of time. Uh, that's yeah. crazy. Yeah, because if even just the album cover, I feel like people would be drawn to that. But yeah, it's not like today where you can just go and listen on YouTube or Spotify. So if it wasn't being on the radio and it wasn't on MTV, but yeah, it's, that's great. But yeah, so anyway, so the GNR lies. What's your guys' take on that one? Because I'm listening back to this and I'm like, ah, I'm just, I'm not in love with any of these songs anymore. I mean, I liked them when I was a kid, but I, I, I'm not like, oh, let me go listen to GNR lies. I mean, with Patience, I feel like that's a masterpiece. That's a great song. But some of the the live, like a suicide EP, I mean, you can tell it's it's recorded before they really started to kind of get their groove. I mean, it's not, horrible but it's more like a, a test of like a, it's almost like demos it should have been almost released like a rarities album or something like that well, i mean you got to understand what they were trying to do at the time or what their manager was trying to do right i mean they were they were back in and they were having trouble generating new material for a new album and getting the band together and coming off the road they were a nightmare and alan Niven, who was the manager at the time i mean he was just trying to buy them some time so they could get their act together i mean this was clearly just something to hold uh the fans over and to hold the record label over that's the only reason it was out there. I mean, you're right. It was cobbled together. I mean, 99.9% .9 of the fans at the time didn't even, they'd never heard live like a suicide. And so they didn't know, you know, it was really just uh, that record on side A. Uh, they didn't probably didn't know it wasn't live either. And then the, the four songs on side two, I mean, they were written in a couple of weeks. They were all four of them were recorded in an afternoon. Right? Hmm. Slash says it's uh, the most lucrative afternoon he's ever spent. And I mean, the demand for all things Guns N' Roses at the time was so hot. I mean, they could have released an album of lullabies and it still would have sold a million copies. And this EP, you know, out there, bam, five million copies. Uh, but th that's why it was out there, just a holdover. You know, it's not something so the band strategically wanted to do. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you're going to find something that's, that's interesting. It's not out there yet. It will be. And I'm not going to uh, ruin Doug's book sales, but Doug Goldstein, who is the manager and He's going to clear stuff up. That's what he's been telling me for, for years. I know him and Alan Niven. Well, I'm friendly with both. Huh. I, I, I don't get in between, you know, who's, you know, who's right and who's wrong. I just tell people stories. But there was a time where a, uh, not, no pun intended, we're not Chinese democracy yet. <laughs> there was a, there was, sorry. I, I, that was a good I, one. That was a deep cut, I but I like our it. Tourette's, uh, yeah. just <laughs> but according to, to Doug, and there's, there's much more to this story. Uh, with Gene or Lies, that there was a fan, him and Axel were just walking, you know, in the parking lot after a show. And there was a fan that wanted an autograph as per usual. Axel, he's, believe it or not, he was fine with it. He's like, I, he had the uh, live, like a suicide album. He's like, where did you get that? Because there was only X amount printed. It's like, how much did you pay for that? And he was like, for whatever amount of money. He's like, no, 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 no. I can't do this. So he, he signs it for him anyway. He's just, it bothers him that this kid is paying so much money. Yeah. So he, he talks to Doug. He's like, what can we do to beat the bootleggers? And I guess not in the, the, the way that we believe Axel doesn't like bootleggers, the, again, Chinese democracy leaks. We're not there yet. Mm -hmm. uh, that what can we do? He's like, we already have this album. Let's just we, we put that out again with four acoustic songs. You have like a whole other album that's going to buy you more time. So, in addition to, yeah, it's buying time. It was also like Axel's like, how do I beat, you know, this kid who just wanted an autograph having to pay like 400 or whatever dollars for this album. Ugh. So like little, little tidbits. That's something Doug wants to do. I sound like uh, Paul Heyman being a conduit for Brock Lesnar or something. <laughs> <laughs> if you get that reference. I don't, but, but uh, it's, I'm I, still I guess, laughing. <laughs> yeah. A point being like, cause I'm telling someone else's story and that's, what's been going right. on. In addition to doing the podcast, I'm working, trying to work on his book. So oh, that's just, cool. It's on my brain. This, yeah. This really long. Yeah. Because you're wearing hat that I bought on Amazon. I don't know if you've noticed that it's, it's terrible. Yeah. You got it's the GNR lies hat. That's awesome. No, no it's, oh, it's, yeah. it's every album. Oh, it's every, oh, okay. I see. Yeah. On the other sides. Oh, that is cool. Wow. That's neat. Did you have that handmade or what? No, no. So someone uh, was actually selling this, and I actually bought it off Amazon. Oh, okay. So, uh, it's not a, if you want to say it's attractive, sure, that's fine. That's cool. Uh, so you know, around around this time, uh, Axel's, uh, you know, this is one of many feuds that he had, but the Axel Rose Vince Neil feud. This is one of the most famous ones. So yeah. the the story I heard was that one night at the Cat House, 
Izzy Stradlin supposedly grabbed Vince Neil's wife's boob and kicked her in the stomach when she was pregnant. And so then Vince Neil's like, if I ever see that motherfucker, I'm going to punch him in the face. And then at the, I think it was the uh, MTV video awards or something. Vince yeah. Neil punches him back uh, backstage and Izzy says he hit like a powder puff. And then <laughs> Axel, you know, they start talking all the shit. And then Vince Neil full on challenges Axel to like a fight. He wanted it in an arena and he wanted it televised. I'm still waiting for this fight, by the way. <laughs> I, mean, I remember that was in all the magazines at the time, right? In, in Metal Edge, it had like a full page. It was in Rip. It was in Hit Parader. I mean, yeah, that was a story. The bench sucker punk that punched him when he came off the stage. And I, I think it was Sharice that he was hitting on, to the best of my knowledge. It's absolutely amazing. And it's it, Axel, what, you did talk about the uh, Bob Guccione uh feud as well oh yeah we'll get to that yeah that's on the for the illusions one but yeah it was never gonna happen it's Axel was uh he threatened a lot of people with fights and people who like vince neal wanted to fight back and it just it just never happened so do you think he was just like trying to stir up publicity like this is like a marketing uh strategy what vince or or axel was trying to stir up uh, marketing okay i mean it's smart by both of them because i'm sure they both got a lot of publicity we're still talking about it 30 years later. I doubt there was any marketing intent on Vince's part when he <laughs> hit him no, in the that face. Was, that's right. true. No, that was just pure, uh, pure hatred from uh, both of them at the time. I don't think any of that was like today. There are strategic, you know, feuds that happen, you know, Drake and somebody, you know, it's not like one of those, one of those, you know, uh, Nicki Minaj and somebody else. Those aren't real. Like they, these guys really, really wanted to fight. You know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it never happened. Uh, maybe, maybe today, maybe one, maybe Vince New will fight like Luke Paul or something like that. <laughs> better than that. Sorry. But if it Hopper. did happen back in the day, who do you think would have won the fight? Axel, because crazy is like always wins. That's what I was thinking. Chris was saying Vince, though. I don't know. I think you, I think you're right. I mean, you got a total road rage, right? Yeah. I wouldn't want yeah. to get on either one of them's bad side, though. I mean, that would. Yeah, they'd probably oh. kick my ass. Even today, they'd probably still be able to kick my ass. But um, so, yeah, before they released the Use Your Illusion thing, they were they had this rule that I guess it was kind of, it was like pulling back. Like they had, it was like an unwritten rule, like when the drugs and shit got too crazy, like if they had to record or do like a concert, they, they were always into drugs and stuff. But if they're like, oh, we actually have to like record an album, we'll kind of pull back on the drugs. And I guess Steven Adler just couldn't get it together. So they had to, they, they said Civil War was the last song I recorded. Uh, it, it was stitched together from 60 takes of drums. They had to like put it together and recording because he just couldn't play a full drum set. Is that, is that true? He couldn't Wait, get it together. Yeah. He, he had a very difficult time. Their addictions, you know, were really getting difficult at this time anyway. I mean, remember when they came off the appetite tour, you know, they were literally homeless street rats before that. And then they come back to a world where they can't even, understand their own fortune of fame right and they got the money to, to feed drug addictions and not your average drug addiction right it was it was heroin especially mm-hmm. for Izzy and adler and slash and even before the bulk of the recordings for illusions i mean when i think about the beginning of this thing unraveling i always think back to those uh rolling stone shows at the coliseum in the fall of 89 uh, guns N' roses did four shows like i paid like a million dollars open for the stones and, you know, they hadn't toured in almost a year uh, and, and they were, you know, sloppy, right? I mean, Slash and, and Adler, particularly on the stage, uh, you know, they weren't tight. They were messy. And, you know, Axl Rose is, is prone to these temper tantrums anyway. Uh, but, of course, he doesn't show up for the first show. So uh, Alan Nevin, of course, works with, uh, as I remember, the, the Stones people and the LAPD uh, to go handcuff them and drag them to the arena. And then they had, uh, it was Living Color was the band, if I remember right, that mm. was opening at the time. Right. And one a Million was out. And of course, One in a Million has these god-awful lyrics, uh, you know, racist lyrics. And so Living Color gets up on the stage and delivers their, you know, uh, address about how inappropriate the song is. Of course, that puts Axel even more of a rage. Uh, and they launch into their opening and the band is in tight and Axel's, and he announces to the whole crowd, right, that this is the last time you're going to see uh, Guns N' Roses, people don't get their stuff together. They, I think he said they don't stop dancing with Mr. Brownstone, which of course was their word for heroin. But I remember reading in Duff's book, I think that, you know, he said that was really the beginning of the end for them. But after that, they were never really the the gang again. Mm. Uh, and I think that just continued when they got to the, when they finally, the record company finally forced them to do some recordings for the Illusioner albums. Yeah. 
uh, Adler, you know, he, he claims that, you know, he was trying to kick the habit and the opiates were affecting him. Uh, but yeah, he couldn't get through civil war and they just, they said, we can't do this. I mean, there, you could write volumes about that particular Adler story in and of itself. It's just crazy that like when guns and roses has to tell you like you're doing too many drugs, like at that point, like they're like, look, we do drugs, but you're like on a different level than us. Like that's, that's crazy. And he never did rejoin, which is sad because I thought he was supposed to rejoin when they had the reunion in 2016, but then he hurt his back or something. So he couldn't come. He did a couple of uh, spots. He did yeah. show up on a couple of, of shows. And I think his involvement at the beginning is something left into uh, for interpretation, you know, wow. depending upon, upon who you ask. Yeah. Uh, but he, he can play shows. I mean, he's doing a, his, his solo uh, thing now. Yeah. I mean, he's out there. He seems to be healthy. But, yeah, at that time, he just couldn't get it together while, yeah, the other guys were slowly dying. They were able to play. Yeah. He couldn't play, you know, and was also slowly dying. And Ugh. it's just a miracle that they're all here. Yeah. No. So, I mean, and this isn't as bad as a Chinese democracy, but it did. I read that it took two years, seven different recording studios, 36. Uh, so, I mean, how many songs were this? There was one thing, 36 songs in 36 days, but I think there's even more songs. I think they had enough for three or four albums. Well, yeah, well, a dozen of those songs on Illusions were holdovers from demos that were done for Appetite for Destruction. Uh, I mean, I don't, know, I don't know that everybody knows that, but it was at least a dozen of them. Yeah, you you could be mine was, I think, a hold. For some reason, that didn't make Appetite, which is that would have been crazy if that song was on Appetite, because that's probably my favorite song on all the Illusions. Oh, yeah, there were there were a lot that were discarded uh, from Appetite. Uh, I thought it was always interesting that they had Sweet Child, they had November Rain, they had Don't Cry. And I read that they actually selected Sweet Child of Mine because they thought it was the weakest of the bunch. They wanted to save the, the other two for their next album, which oh. you know is, is left to debate. Uh, huh. But Back Off Bitch and You Could Be Mine were two of the last ones to get scrapped from the Appetite Sessions. And even at the time, they thought You Could Be Mine had you know potential uh, as a single. Uh, but they were two of the last ones to get scratched. Yeah, so the first Use Your Illusion one, um, God, I mean, I really like this one. I think this is probably the better of the two, in my opinion. Um, just overall, because there's so many good, there's only a couple of songs that I'm not a huge fan of, but, um, you know, Dustin Bones is good. Double Talk and Jive, Don't Cry. I mean, so many good ones. What's your take? What's your guys' take on that one? The first user illusion. I I just played uh, Guns N' Roses, The Not In This Lifetime Pinball the other day. Oh, nice. Uh, it's at a bar in, in Brooklyn. I'm not, I don't have the money to own it. <laughs> you're able to select a song when you get to, you know, get a certain amount of points. Oh. And I selected Double Talk and Jive. I love that song. Is it, so that's, that. you know, the story behind that though. So, you know, cause the lyric says found a head and an arm in a garbage can. So I guess the cop, there was a cop that literally found a head and I think it was either maybe not a, an arm, maybe it was a foot in the dumpster next to the studio, uh, this Hollywood uh, Studio 56. And Matt Sorm later would like record there for some other project. And they like saw ghosts and shit. And they, they had to like, they had to like leave. They're like, we're done with this studio. And that, that studio shut down now, but it's pretty crazy. I, I don't know if they ever caught the murderer. It's kind of creepy that I, cause I always wonder that's kind of a weird lyric and it was based on a true story supposedly. I, love yeah, it. I read that same thing. I, I don't know how long ago I read that. Maybe not much more than that. Uh, but that's definitely one of the cooler tracks on the album. Uh, you know, I, I, you know, I probably will get a bad rap here because I'm not maybe as big a fan of the albums as, as some folks. But don't get me wrong. I mean, when they came out, uh, I remember standing in line at midnight and, and the line was four blocks long uh, around the corner. And I mean, what an event it was, right? I mean, this is probably, these were the most anticipated rock albums, maybe even in history. Uh, there was a genius marketing idea to turn the double album into this, you know, one and two and release them at the same time. It was more than just a release. It was really an event. Uh, but I had, we bought them on cassette tape at the time. And I brought up buying those cassette tapes three times because you just wore them out in the car. It was really all I listened to at the time. I mean, as a crazy teenage kid, I remember knowing just all the lyrics to every song, even like Garden of Eden. If you could result, uh, recite all the lyrics to Garden of Eden, you know, something was wrong with you for sure. <laughs> no, <laughs> I agree. It's, it's, do you feel the same way, Brett? You were what would have been like, what, seven years old when this stuff came out? Oh, yeah. I was, so my first concert was technically uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles coming out of their shells. <laughs> yeah, I thought that Radio City Music Hall. Okay. Oh, yeah. 
so I'm, yeah, I, I, I always like to say, like, yeah, I, I may have not experienced certain things, but I, I know what the dinosaurs are. I, I know what the Civil War is, whatever. Yeah. But, you know, as I was growing, my dad was a big source of classic rock for me. And then for me finding, I went the CD route. You know, yeah, I had cassettes. I, my first cassette was Dookie, um, uh, Green Day's Dookie, which I got in a Hanukkah stocking. That's, a, that's another story. <laughs> <laughs> okay. when, uh, I, that's when I was a kid. And so when I was finally able to buy my own CDs, I'm like, I want to get Guns N' Roses. I'm like, I love whenever I hear this band on the radio. This is the, the, the band that I, 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 this might be my favorite band, you know. Uh, so a friend of mine recommended first. Uh, we just already spoke about Appetite, but when I got the Illusions finally on CD, I've never experienced a journey like that. You know, I, I wasn't, you know, I didn't have the wall. You know, I didn't have, you know, I can I really experience. Yeah, Appetite was a great album. But this was like, I felt like I was in a journey going from each, you know, the first track to the last track on both albums. And that's the way I feel about it now. Yeah, it is, it's such a popular discussion. I don't know if that's next on, on your list of, you know, cutting it down to one album. I wouldn't change. Yeah, it. we've all done that. Yeah, Chris and I have both done that. We've compared notes on that. Well, you'll have to send us your list of that afterwards. But you wouldn't change. You'd keep it as two albums, really. I would keep it as two albums. The only thing I would do different. And. I don't even know if I would do different because one would be the don't cry alternate because I already know the song. I don't want to learn it again. I, I, I hear the song and my brain like hurts when I'm trying to sing the original version. Yeah. I never yeah. listened to that alternate lyric one either. You're right. But doing the GNR podcast and I ask these questions also, there are a lot of people that really identify and love those lyrics of the alternate version. So really? for those people, okay. I'll keep it. Okay. In my world, my world is the crazy precursor. To, uh, it's like not just the precursor of like the experiment of what Chinese democracy would be. It's such a, uh, I've, I, I went from hating it to now being like, it's the obla di obla da, the Beatles, kind of like, it's just a bullshit song. And if you want to sing along to it, great. If you don't like it, fine. Like you, it doesn't def define the band of the catalog. So that's my uh, feeling on it. And considering we don't get new music much, Let's keep as much music out there by Guns N' Roses as possible. Don't take anything away. Let's we're, we're taking stuff that didn't used to be like the old song, Shadow of Your Love. Yeah. That back. So let's bring it's let's not like let's add. Let's not sure. No, no, we're not really gonna to take any music away. I don't think once it's out there, it's it's there. You're but away, you're not gonna go into Spotify and delete No, stuff. no, I don't think they can do that. I hope not. Oh. Um but you know, it's funny because like the user illusion too, I really like the kind of lesser no, uh, lesser played songs. I don't know if I've ever heard uh, Get in the Ring or Shotgun Blues live, but I love those two songs are just so they're kind of more appetite driven, kind of that, like hard rock. And actually, it's surprising. They're both. I think those are both by. Oh, no. Get in the Ring is Rose Slash and, and Duff. And but Shotgun Blues is all Rose. And they're, they're more like kind of the appetite sounding. Sometimes where the illusion albums lose me a little bit with is with the long ballads. Like I felt like there was just too many. And, and like the locomotive, it just some of those things just kind of went on a little bit too long for me. I mean, I still like both albums. I still like every song, but um, I mean, I could have done without some of those at the time. And I think it would have been a stronger album if it was just one. I think, you know, it, it would be regarded a lot higher if they had just taken all the best songs out of each one and then released the not don't release the other stuff, just re release that later or as a rarities album or something. I mean, you know, I mean, I, you've read the book. I'm, I'm probably more critical of the albums than your average yeah. person. And actually, before we get to that, I think we should all note that we've probably just made history here. Because so I was listening to, to Brando there, and I think this is the first time anyone's ever used Oba De Oba Da and My World <laughs> in the same comparative sense. That was um, awesome. That has never been done in the history of music. <laughs> but I, I get what you're saying, right? Uh, Thank you. That's all I ask. <laughs> That's a comparison, but as long as you get it. Yeah. I do get it. I get where you're coming from. But yeah, I mean, you mentioned the album to a journey and, and, you know, some of that was a little much, right? Like as the biggest fan of Appetite in the whole world, you know, I mean, I was a fan of the Illusion albums, but it was different, right? I mean, the sheer variety of songs alone. I mean, there were balls out rockers. There were these epic ballads. Uh, Chuck, you were talking about with these intricate orchestral arrangements. There were cover tunes. There was four or five songs that had lead vocals by people that weren't Axel. You know, there was a mm -hmm. host of synthesizers and instrumentation. They had pianos and strings and choirs and banjos. Uh, this was not Appetite for Destruction right. in any way, shape or form. And the band wasn't, I mean, when Adler left, you know, I mean, people talk about 
you know, he's not really the most technically competent drummer in the whole world. Uh, but even Izzy had said, you know, he said they first noticed it um, in the Appetite Tour when uh, Adler broke his hand. They had Fred Curry from Cinderella play a show. Mm. And they said Fred was, you know, super technically proficient, uh, which is actually maybe a little surprising because I know he had struggled on the first couple of Cinderella albums. But they said, you know, that sense of push and pull and swing that Adler offered, uh, Izzy said, hey, the songs were done technically proficient, but they sounded terrible. Hmm. And, you know, you, Matt Storm was a great drummer, but, you know, it was more of a, a metronome type of technical approach. And he's got a pretty heavy hand, not taken away from him. And the songs, they sound different. The production was different. You know, in my mind, there was very little on User Illusion that sounded like Appetite for Destruction. I think You Could Be Mine was probably the only thing I thought sounded like Appetite for Destruction. Mm -hmm. um, actually, I remember before the albums came out, and again, this is, I'm dating myself, but if, if you remember or you know, uh, there was this thing called a, a, a single, a cassette single. Yeah, sure. Out before the album. And uh, I had You Could Be Mine. I had Civil War on the other side, but I just, did, I had that cassette single in the car and I would just run it over and over and over. Yeah. And I've never listened to Civil War because I don't know what was wrong with me. I just loved this aggression with You Could Be Mine that I thought was akin to Appetite. All I had in the car was that slave to the grind at the time. Uh, but, you know, I thought they would have probably done better for this fan if it was only one album. Uh, yeah, I, I agree with what you're saying. I mean, why take anything away? Mm -hmm. uh, except for maybe my world now. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's interesting, though, because I'm actually in the same position, which is probably more unique as Brando, in that I got the Use Your Illusions ones first because I became a fan in like 92. And so that was the most recent stuff. So then I, I, I became a fan through the Use Your Illusions. And then later I got Appetite. And then I was like, oh, OK, well, yeah, this is pretty good, too, I guess. So, I mean, that's really obviously a great album too. In, in terms of the whole album, like every song is good, but I mean, use your illusions. There's so many songs on both those that I, I just really, I love. I mean, it's just, there's a couple that I could have, you know, could have done without, but uh, overall, I think I, I, I would almost say they're almost as good as appetite. Like those albums, like they're to me personally, I just, I, I agree with Brando. It's kind of like that journey. Like I liked having the variety. I liked hearing, you know, dust and bones, like just the, the lyrics and stuff of these, some of these songs are so, especially as a kid, like 13, 14 years old, you're reading these lyrics and you're just like, whoa. And like, and then yeah. So let's talk about the get in the ring. Cause I'm reading that as a kid. When you're 13, 14, you're like, whoa, this guy's like telling this guy to fuck off and like talk all this shit. And so the thing with Bob Guccione Jr. at spin, I guess he published this contract that the band had set out to, uh, sent out to the media that had kind of like these demands, like, okay, if you're going to publish our pictures, we want like, we own the rights and all this stuff. And that, pissed off Axel and I'm sure the whole band a lot is do you guys know that story with, with, with that whole like media contract thing yeah no I do and I was lucky enough to actually uh speak to no I'm going to tell my fiance right now that I'm doing a podcast so I have to text you back okay, okay? <laughs> all right well, that's fine yeah this is very important all right I'll talk to you later I love you bye all right so <laughs> that's what happened. I don't know I thought I thought I would add some like ad lib element to it that no really I love happened. it uh so with, with I had Bob Guccione on. I can't believe he actually answered me. I, I, he Wait, you had him. Bob Guccione Jr. on? Yeah. Oh, so I have like to a, listen to that episode. I don't think I've heard that one. Like a year ago, year and a half ago. Okay. Maybe. It was before the pandemic, definitely. Sure. But he has like a travel website now. Okay. And I emailed the travel website. I was like, if this reaches him, you know, I wrote it more professionally, of course. Great. And he was happy to do it as long as I promoted his travel website, which... I forget now, <laughs> but he would do exactly what you just said. He thought the, the rules were ridiculous. He, you know, he was a professional in, in media. He, he knew the rules of engagement. He just thought it was a little ridiculous though. So he thought it'd be like a little funny just to, to print it. Axel, obviously Axel did not find it funny. And his reaction to the song was to laugh because whether Axel wants to admit it or not, I guess, uh, Bob Guccione Jr. is a really accomplished fighter. Like, oh, I don't, like uh, I don't know if he's a if it's a black belt. I don't want to just completely lie, but he he knows how to fight. He knows okay. how to hurt people. And he's like, okay, uh, whenever like I think uh, he he contacted Doug Goldstein. He's like, whenever Axel wants to, and Axel never <laughs> responded. Well, so and I like, I heard that Axel didn't want to put that part into the the song. It was he blames it on Slash and uh, Duff. That it was their idea to like, hey, why don't you just riff about all this like shit that all these people who want to fight because there was this break in the song and and then he regretted it. I don't know if that's true. 
That part I do not remember. Okay. It doesn't seem I, I like something remember. Axel would regret. Okay. <laughs> but I think I actually read that same thing, Joe. Okay. Yeah. But then, and then around this time too. So the albums come out and then, you know, they start touring and then Izzy quits. And uh, this, I don't know if Guns N' Roses was ever the same after Izzy quit. Just because not necessarily with his rhythm playing. He's a great guitarist, obviously. But as a songwriter, I think they lost so much. He, I think he contributed so much to the band as a, the, the first, uh, you know, well, technically four albums, I guess his songwriting contributions were, were huge. And he even sang on a couple of those illusion songs too. So it's kind of sad that, and that's again, another one where I'm like, well, I wish he would have came back when they did the reunion. But the thing about Guns N' Roses, I thought was the whole was always so much bigger than the sum of the parts, mm -hmm. right? Everybody brought something pretty unique to that band. You know, whether it was, you know, Izzy's perfect ability to complement what Slash was doing on lead guitar with some really interesting rhythm guitar parts or songwriting or, you know, speak about Adler's drumming all we want, but we can talk about the, the swing he added. Of course, Axel's unique. Uh, Duff brings this punk element. I mean, they all would get together in the appetite days. You know, they're sitting in the van on this early hell tour and someone starts with the riff and they build the song as a band. And it was this unique conglomeration of things that was just like lightning in the bottle. But the time you got to use your illusions, uh, you know, band had gone in separate ways, pretty much. I mean, people were bringing in songs fully written, whether it was Izzy with his songs or Slash with his material or the stuff that was holdovers. You know, there wasn't that same group dynamic. Uh, but as far as Izzy departing, I mean, it was one thing and pretty much one thing only. Well, it wasn't one thing only, but for the most part, you know, he got sober. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, it, it's hard to be around that atmosphere. Right. When you're sober and there's that, you know, he was tired of Axl Rose's behavior. He was tired of what he thought Axl was doing to the band. And it was really difficult being around junkies when you're, you know, have a newfound sobriety. And he mm -hmm. just, from what I read, said, listen, uh, I, I've been here, done this. Like, this isn't for me anymore. And he split. Yeah. It's too bad. But I mean, God, the, the concerts during this era, too, because now you've got the user illusions and the appetite and the generalized to pull from the catalog. I, my first concert ever was Guns N' Roses Metallica. Did you guys see this tour? Yeah. Oh, my God. I was too young, but I told you my first concert was the Turtles. But that's right. amazing. That's that's a better first concert, I guess. I don't know. It's on Paul. <laughs> Actually, when I saw the Illusion tour, um, I saw it in June of '91 in Philadelphia. Cause I'm from the Northeast. Uh, okay. And at that time, Izzy was still in the band. And what struck me, you know, because I was still a young teenager, uh, because the Illusion albums weren't out. But of course, Guns N' Roses being Guns N' Roses, right? I mean, three quarters of the damn set was the Illusion albums. Uh, so they came out and they, you know, of course, this huge fan I was of the Appetite album, they came out and opened with uh, Perfect Crime. And I was like, this is cool, but I don't know this song. And then they went into Brownstone, which is cool. But then it was uh, well, right next door to hell and Bad Obsession, right? I'm thinking, oh, I don't man, it would have been so songs. cool to hear those. I don't know if like they played those when I saw them. It's yeah, been I mean, so long. That, it was pretty heavy on the Illusions. And I remember when they got to, to Don't Cry. Right. Because I had heard this was like the first song they written and you would read about it, Metal Edge. And they started playing. I'm like, OK, soft ballad. I'm like, can we please just hear more of Appetite for Destruction? <laughs> right? You don't like but the ballads, huh? You like the, they like more of the rock and stuff. Well, I mean, sure. But, you know, when you're in uh, an arena with uh, 17,000 other people. Yeah. <laughs> you don't like, experience think, that? Like, what, what about with the strange when that comes on? You don't get that kind of experience. Because that's that's the uniqueness of 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 GNR, where you will have the the rocker in your face. Everybody looks like they just want to punch each other. I mean, I'm exaggerating, of course. But then you have, I mean, when they debuted, I'm mean, not debuted. Uh, when they finally brought back, oh, it was not. It was Locomotive, right? It was Locomotive that they brought back a couple years ago. Yeah, I mean, fan base went nuts. They went nuts for it. So I think when I was younger too. I was like, what's with these bands? Despite November Rain was the song that hooked me in first. Mm -hmm. uh, but the longer songs, I was I was a bit like, I want the rock and roll songs. But the older I got, the more I appreciated Breakdown, Locomotive, and and what he was able to do. And I, you know, I certainly wouldn't have been able to, uh, to handle Chinese democracy as a young kid. I, I like it now, but I, I wouldn't have been able to handle it as a kid, uh, especially coming off Appetite. Sure. And if that's your first introduction to them, I could see it being what is this yeah like, that's yeah. that's if tough you shock, and you went kind of like usually your, your, your illusions backward it's like you learn different yeah you know? so it wasn't as much of a culture shock to you as it was to, to chris sure so what about the that's spaghetti more, incident I, well before you go there i mean that tour deserves to be recognized for what it was though right i mean this is one yeah. of the most dysfunctional high drama tours <laughs> in, in rock and roll history right. 
not to mention the longest tour in rock and roll history, perhaps. Yeah. Uh, they had over 7 million people by the time that thing was done, you know, 30 some countries, uh, you know, more than two years. Uh, and those shows were, I mean, we all know, we don't have to recount this. Everybody who's listening to this knows, right? Every show was, you know, a spectacle of is Axel going to show up? Uh, are they going to go on two hours late or three hours late? Uh, but they were still amazing performances at the time. Uh, I mean, I was lucky enough to see a couple of them. Of course, nowadays you can watch as many as you want and go out on YouTube. Uh, but, you know, the, the band was pretty tight to your point when they hit the stage. Yeah. So, uh, and, you know, just to play for as long as they did, and they still did this. It's incredible. I mean, I don't know any other bands that play for three hours, uh, especially with the level of intensity, you know, they're bringing, uh, particularly Axl Rose. I mean, that's not an easy vocal assignment to sing that type of material for three hours. I know he has oxygen beforehand and everything, but God bless them. Uh, it's an amazing accomplishment. But this was in, between St. Louis and Montreal and how many other things could we talk about if we could talk all night. This was a heck of a tour. Right? This was not your average tour. Yeah, riots and all, and all sorts of fire with James Hetfield's hand. And How did I, they do those long shows if they're all fucked up, though? Just adrenaline, baby. It's the or coke or <laughs> speed or what was it like? They do the downers after? or Because, I mean, I've, yeah, they I've sounded all, great. They didn't sound fucked up or anything. It's crazy. I, often said that tour itself belongs in the hall of fame because what tour do we talk about like that? Do we talk about, I mean, yeah, like, like really, when you really think about it, what is like the anniversary? Like every year we talk about use your illusion tour. Do we do that with any other band like that? Yeah. It's like, Oh, I saw Metallica and, and justice for all. Awesome. Awesome. But do you really talk about that tour? Like we talk about use your illusion. So, yeah, no, I, I, it was amazing as a 14 year old kid. I was like, I was blown away. Metallica was amazing too, of course. And to see those two back to back and it was of course a late show. I think it got out at like three or four in the morning. And so, yeah, that was, uh, my parents still came and picked me up to their credit. That was amazing that they let me do that. But anyways, yeah. So we'll move on though to spaghetti incident. I don't, I don't have a lot to say about this one. Um, you know, the title obviously was a reference to Adler's drug habit because he, uh, or yeah, he referred to his cocaine as spaghetti because he kept it in the refrigerator next to the Italian takeout or something like that. I mean, I don't know. I, I remember he being so excited for new Guns N' Roses and I just couldn't wait. I was like, I don't care what the hell they'll call it. I grabbed the album and I listened to it and just kept listening to it, tried to get into it. Just couldn't ever really get into this one as much as the, the illusions or the appetite. I don't know. What do you, what's your guys take? Yeah, it's underrated. To be honest with you, you think it's so? Under, so underrated, huh? Because uh, immediately I, I loved Duff's, even though I'm not the biggest fan of Duff's voice. You know, uh, I think it works in certain punk ways. Yeah, uh, it's true. I mean, so fine going back as an album, I, it works because it was with Axel. But when he does Attitude, I love it when he does it live. Mm -hmm. uh, the Spaghetti Incidents, I, 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 the story I heard was when uh, Stephen was suing. Uh, the band for his uh, his rights, you know, and it was something in the papers to the lawyer. It was something like they were trying to build characters, like uh, character witnesses, you know, like what was being roommates with Duff like? <laughs> and what, apparently, <laughs> one time they had, an they had an argument of, uh, you know, fucking, you left too much spaghetti, you know, you left some leftover spaghetti in the uh, in the refrigerator, stuff that me and my girlfriend, you know, bitch about, you know, it's dish and stuff. So. The lawyer goes and it reads that and takes it, you know, he asks stuff like, how do you get along with Steven? Eh, you know, we get along. It's just sometimes like, you know, if you leave spaghetti, we had that spaghetti incident, whatever. So the lawyer, I, I believe during the trial, so asks seriously, can you tell me about the spaghetti incident? <laughs> yeah, well, that's it's, true. It's yeah. Like what? It's like, what are you talking about? So uh, that that's the story that I heard, but. You know, a similar story, just a slightly different version. Yeah, I think okay. I've heard that all too. I did hear this is interesting too that originally it was going to maybe be called the pension fund because they were trying to, and I think this is really cool. They're trying to help these artists um, that wrote these songs by by giving them some royalties of these like kind of some of these uh, punk bands they covered were more obscure and maybe you know probably weren't doing too great financially. So this is going to help them out because they're you know they figure they're going to sell a couple million copies of this and they'll get some royalties. So that's kind of cool. They left it in the liner notes to yeah. please check out the originals. Mm -hmm. And I, I just think it's awesome because I'm just an old school punk fan. So I love, I love the fact that they cover the dead boys and they got to work with Michael Monroe. Yeah. So there are some good moments like, yeah, 
It's all covers. I get it. Especially now when we get to see them, for those of us who have seen them live when concerts uh, were still a thing and they keep adding covers in, into the set. It's like, mm-hmm. well, Absolute Slash are back together. Stop playing uh, The Seeker. Like, come on. <laughs> I, I don't care. Yeah, what is it? Why do they do Because it's not like they had never done covers before. They did a, a bunch of covers on The Illusions and even the GNR Lies. So it's like, then they did a whole album. I feel like it, this would have been better as just like an EP or something. I don't know. Sure. I think it, it's, again, I think it goes back to like, I, the fact that I like the band Fear, which was cool. And, uh, what was the cover they did of, of Fear on there? But they were the first punk band ever on Saturday Night Live because Jim Belushi and wanted them on there. So I think it was. Like, I don't care about I you. I don't care about you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And, the, and of course, the Charles Manson. You know, it's very interesting that they. What was this? Yeah. What was the. Was that just to try to stir up controversy? Was there, Did they really like that song? I mean, it was kind of strange. That was a strange choice. It's not that it was nothing to support Manson and what he did. It was nothing like that. I'm sure part of it was like, I think it's Axel was really against the press then. And it's just so interesting considering the press was so tame to where, where it is now, you know? And he's like, they want to make me into, you know, I love serial killers. Fine. Fuck you. I love them. You know, hmm. fine. Here, here, here you go. And uh, it's interesting. And I actually got to speak with uh, uh, Damon Harriman who played, Charles uh, Manson in both uh, Mindhunter in the uh, Quentin Tarantino movie. What was it? Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Oh, yeah. It's just, he happened to play Manson twice. So I guess I asked him about his music. Like, what do you think of Manson the, while studying for the role? And he's like, it's it's good. Yeah, you could see why there was some interest, but you can also see why he never made it. So it's just interesting. What if he did make it? What if he done all those horrific things? Yeah, what if Fidel Castro became a professional baseball player? I know. You know There's all sorts I, of uh, stuff like that. All those things, what ifs, but yeah, yeah. yeah. So I, I, it's it was interesting. So yeah, I think it's just an underrated uh, record. That's my okay. My there were things to like about it, right? I mean, first of all, I mean, when Illusions was first being considered for a three or four disc set, you know, they had a lot of songs. These these songs recorded then, right? And they were going to do it as an EP after the albums were out. They said, let's just make it a full album. One of the things I liked about it, and actually overall, I mean, I probably wasn't a huge fan of it just from what you said, Chuck. I mean, I wanted another Guns N' Roses album. Right? I didn't want a cover song album. But one of my, not to go back to Illusions, but one of my biggest challenges with Illusions was, you know, Appetite had this real raw, ferocious energy, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, that's not to say it was recorded on, on a demo budget, like something like Bastard Pussycat's uh, debut album or Poison's debut. That was a very meticulously made album, particularly Ash, uh, Axel Vocals, which he did almost one line at a time, or Slash a Solo. I mean, they spent seven months making that. But Illusion albums, you know, if there was any hint that those songs were going to be similar to Appetite, you know, Axel would stay up in the studio. I think we talked about this last time all night, you know, tinkering with synthesizers and, and layering yeah. and multi cracking. And, you know, these were, in my opinion, overproduced albums, you know, that just sucked the energy out of them to some extent compared to Appetite. But on the Spaghetti Incident, you know, there was a little more of a reversion from a production standpoint back to just a, a raw, more authentic type of recording. So mm-hmm. I appreciated that about it. You know, it didn't have this overblown grandiosity for lack of a better term uh, that the usual illusion albums had but unlike rando i'm not a big fan of punk uh, so you know i wasn't a huge fan of the, the song selections uh, but i thought the performances were really good right axel sounded great uh you know it was just good to hear them wailing away but you know now 30 some years later i don't ever reach for it to listen to see that that's, that's my thing yeah i don't really ever reach for that one and then i tried to listen to some of it today i'm like yeah i'm just not i think maybe it's the song choices i think you're right because the band sounds good but i'm just yeah. i'm not really into those songs i get it, I get it. yeah i'm not going to criticize and also i am a fan of the uh you know the old school crooning and uh you know so since i don't have you that was a, yeah do, that was cool i do appreciate the doo-wop too especially with the video with the uh gary oldman devil so you got to give them gary oldman props yeah there so there there's some highlights but i get what you're saying I yeah you. for sure so then anyway, he went in the next album I mean, we have like this huge period of time but i guess i didn't realize this today that uh izzy kind of came back to the fold for a little bit in 95 and he and duff wrote 10 songs together and rec- even recorded them as demos. I've never heard these demos. I don't know whatever happened to them. Um, but uh, obviously it didn't you know, turn out to anything on Chinese democracy, but I'm, I'm curious if maybe they would consider using those on the next album. Um, I guess one of the songs was called down by the ocean or down by the sea. And it was like six years later after 95 Axel called Izzy and wanted to use that song. Do you guys hear about that? I have not heard that particular one. I had heard that title, but I've never heard the demo. 
And I don't know what became of those songs. I heard the same thing, but I've never heard a leak. And if there was out there, we would have heard it. Yeah. yeah. They, they've tried to bring, at times, Izzy, especially, you know, during the Velvet Revolver days, you know, there were times Izzy would get in the fold. Um, but it just never, as you mentioned, panned out uh, per se. But yeah, that would be amazing. And that's that's the big thing now. Uh, if there is, I, there is a new album being worked on, uh, we just don't know when kind of thing. It's being worked on, whatever worked on means. It's something, something is something. Okay. <laughs> Uh, so I think that's going to be the biggest uh, point of contention because there are so many uh, songs from the Chinese democracy uh, era that could have been three albums, as said by Ch- uh, Sebastian Bach, who said that. And there, are, you can also hear it about the amount of leaks in, uh, that, that came out there. Some uh, have vocals, some instrumentals. And then if you have these unused demos, do they bring Izzy back? So there's a lot of what do, what direction do they go in now? Mm-hmm. Yeah, not, kind of situation yeah for sure well i mean so it took a long time and meanwhile the rest of the band's doing velvet revolver and then gilby's doing his solo stuff and izzy uh, izzy's doing solo stuff as well but uh dizzy reed he got to stay in the band and so it's dizzy and axel but isn't this album see this is my biggest thing with this album and i've i've become more of a fan of it over the years but i feel like it's not really a guns and roses album it's more just an axel rose solo album and i often wonder why didn't he just call it axel rose because i feel like his name is as almost i feel like it's as big as guns and roses is it not i think it would have been not that the album wasn't commercial suicide anyway but i mean he would have been crazy to not call it guns and roses right? really you think so i mean he's got the, he's got a huge name but it, it's one one hundredth the size of guns and roses from a marketing standpoint hmm yeah, I think you have to do that. And, and also his vision, I believe I had to, I reread an interview he did in 2000, uh, in the year 2000, uh, which is now triggering the thing from Conan O'Brien. If you used to watch back in the day. I love Conan. Year 2000. Oh yeah, that? I remember that. Yeah, I can't hit the, the, that note. So it, it, cause I recently had David Wild on, he used to write for uh, Rolling Stone and he did that interview and he got to hear Chinese democracy legally before everybody else did mm. and so there's some notes from axel say you know he was asked that question by david and i think he just had a certain vision for what guns N' roses was always supposed to be and he just looks at it like that it's not just like it's about him huh. it's about the entity of guns N' roses and i think he wanted it to have a band he didn't want to have all this changeover he didn't want to constantly find a new guitarist no he wanted to add a third guitarist that yeah. he that's that's for sure, and hmm. it, uh, I don't believe Slash wanted it to be uh, Paul Tobias, Paul Hughie, uh at all, and I think that was the issue. And according to Doug, uh, he gave Duff and Slash every opportunity to get a third guitarist, and no one ever worked out. It's it just one of those things. So the band con- continually got bigger, and I think that was always Axel's vision, even though at its core. You, you know he's a piano guy. It's it's the acoustic stuff, which I love, and that's Guns N' Roses at, at its core. But he, I mean, it's the Elton John thing. You know, he yeah, uh, Queen and Elton John. Yeah, Queen and Elton John, exactly. Hmm. That's, that's that's his vision. You can always do. It's like yeah, t- you can tie your mother down, or Bohemian Rhapsody. Why do you get to do or? It's both. So that's kind of his thing. Okay. That, that's, yeah, I mean. For him, you know? <laughs> I, I think the the first time this album kind of when I first got it again, I was so excited. New Guns N' Roses, oh my god! But yeah, it doesn't sound anything, even like the Illusion stuff. I was like, dude, I don't know what this is. I did like the first single, Chinese Democracy. I like that one, and then the rest, I kind of just I just couldn't get into it. And then I saw them on this tour. Um, it must have been like I don't know, 2012 or something like that. And um, then I think I started listening to some of those songs more, and I was like, oh, this. It is like there's something interesting about it. It's kind of like you said earlier with the Illusions albums about the journey. It's like this journey. I don't know. It's like, wow, if you just kind of sit back and listen, it, it is it is weird. There's like some cool solos and stuff. And uh, especially the first uh, like three songs, like Chinese Democracy, Shackler's Revenge, Better. And then um, is it, I think some of the, there's a couple of the ballads that I do like. And then there's a few that I just, I still can't get into, but um, the, when they do them live, they sound, they do sound kind of cool. I got to say like with the solos and everything and the guitars, I kind of like it. But you talk about journey, right? I mean, before we get into the songs, I mean, we at least get, have to give a nod to the journey or, or odyssey for lack of a better <laughs> word. That was the making of this album. Mm-hmm. Right? I mean, there's nothing that's been, we talk about the illusion tours <laughs> being 
you know, a singular event, there was nothing ever like the making of Chinese democracy. You know, fourteen million maybe, dollars to make it, right, most expensive million, rock album in history. I, I mean, this record would play with more delays, reconfigurations, re-recordings, lineup changes, management changes, not to mention every other form of havoc and disruption and delay you could possibly conceive uh, than any record in history. Right? I mean, this was a ridiculous event, you know, of so much folly and absurdity getting it out there. Uh, and we were there the whole time, right? Waiting for it and, and dying for it. And how many times was it going to come out next month? 25, 30 or next year? And how many times was it done? Yeah. And then it wasn't done. And then it was re-recorded. How many band members came in and out? Uh, you know, for those of us that were living that, uh, it, it was beyond spectacularly ridiculous. Uh, do you remember the Dr. Pepper promotion? It got so bizarre yeah. at the end. Yeah, wasn't the that the thing that finally pushed them over the edge where they finally released it? At the timing did coincide. I don't know that that drove Because he, he challenged, he said, if, if if they release this album, what was it? Everyone gets a free Dr. Pepper or something like that? A free Dr. Pepper. Of course, you couldn't do it right at the time. The server crashed immediately. So no yeah. one actually got it. Uh, that's smart. Yeah, and actually didn't like that. <laughs> of course he didn't, right? I mean, he, it was a total tirade. It was, it was some of the only things you heard from him. And that was a bizarre thing. The album came out and there was zero press. I mean, less than zero. I remember when I got the album, of course, you know, you had waited so long as a huge fan. I walked down to the Best Buy. You know, people remember going to Best Buy to buy albums. And I was I expecting a huge event. I have, I, have that? I have the vinyl that I got from Best Buy behind me. If you could uh, see nice. It. Oh, yeah, see it. <laughs> but I go in there and I'm expecting this horde of people. And there's like no one in the store, right? And there's this huge display of, of albums. And I pick one up and I'm thinking this is, you know, a landmark moment in my life. And it's you know looking around like every nobody's business it's every, any regular day huh uh, that's depressing yeah. compared to like the tower record stuff with illusions i heard slash was like hiding behind the two-way mirror at tower records for the illusions like watching people's reactions to that album so that's kind of sad that's also just a, you know a comment on people buying music in general though i agree with that but well, yeah i, I thought Chris, had so promising parts right to your point you know i thought uh, better had some some cool melody uh, on the verses, and I thought that the chorus was pretty neat. I thought parts of Shackler's Revenge had, of course, I couldn't get around the fact that I think Shackler's Revenge was five songs. I never quite figured out which one it is, uh, you know, five within one. I thought Street of Dreams had some beautiful stuff, and, and this I love was beautiful, but I personally, and, you know, for those out there that love the album, I'm sorry, I just, I can't connect with it really, uh, you know, and maybe that's just because I'm so stupid that I can only, I, I can't stop not comparing everything to Appetite for Destruction, which is really a horrible thing to do. Yeah. Um, but That's it's just tough. this dissonance of sounds and styles. And, you know, there's like three attempts to re-record a strange, perhaps. I don't know. It, it's tough for me. And I listen to it all the time, trying to see what other people see in it. So it's not like I'm, I'm closed minded on it. Um, I don't know. You seem to be a fan, Brando. Though, yeah. Right? Let's hear your take, Brando. You've got I'm the glad. vinyl. I'm, uh, well, it's just to go take a couple steps back. You talk about Best Buy. You talk about the experience of 1991. That I, I didn't get to have that. So I was <laughs> experience that. So I go. Did down you to camp the out Buy. to the Best Buy or anything like the night? I did. You're the only out. one there. Okay. Yeah. I know. I, I would have been. I would have been. I, I went. You know, probably earlier than I normally would have gone out. You know, being probably in college at the time or around that time. You know, going like 10 a.m. shortly after Best Buy opened. Uh, there's no line. It's everything. Yeah, you see the one display in front with the vinyl, you know. And I picked up the vinyl and I held it above my head like Simba, you know, on the Mufasa and Simba the Lion King. I'm like, real. I have it. No one can take this away from me. Yeah. Uh, and I got the CD also because I I only really had a CD player. I never don't even have a record player. I, I for whatever reason I wanted to have the vinyl of Chinese Democracy. Like I was Indiana Jones finding some secret like you know <laughs> infant or something. It was ridiculous. So when I got it, sort of listening to it, I'm like, I heard Chinese democracy before, you know, especially with the leaks, you know, uh, that's a whole other conversation. Um, should I have listened to them before or, or, or not? I mean, it was part of that ride of being a Guns N' Roses fan, wondering if you were ever going to hear anything, mm. you know, so it needed to take part in it. So I, I did like Chinese democracy a lot. The first song, uh, you know, Shackle's revenge. I don't know why I know. I hear what you're saying, Christopher, it it really introduced me to to Buckethead, and I've become such a Buckethead fan. After it was just something like I I've, I've never heard guitar played like that before, and it's something like what like what is this? I did not say what is this in a, in a good way when I first time I heard If the World, when it started out with that falsetto uh, yeah. guitar, 
And I, and I remember saying out loud, I'm by myself in my apartment at the time. What the fuck is this? <laughs> <laughs> you know, and it's just, you know, Axel sounds different and I'm listening to it. So it, to be honest, speed it up. I, I took three solid listens, three listens uh, through to really appreciate what I was listening to. You know, I th- there was a time, perhaps one of uh, a few puns in there. There was a time song, perhaps one of the, of the leaks that could be on a future record. Uh, but there was a time features one of the best solos I've ever heard in my life. You know, that's that really, if anything, made me the biggest bucket that fan ever. I was lucky to have seen him live at least once after the fact. I'm like, I got to see Buckethead. Uh, and, and Prostitute, one of the best uh, endings to an album ever. I hmm. just think that it's it's phenomenal. But it's a lot of adjustment to, you know, because Axel's voice, it's not that it changes so much like it does from like uh, Welcome to the Jungle to It's So Easy. You're hearing an aged Axel for the first time. And also you're hearing things that were recorded back in 1999. So it's like, what version of Axel am I really hearing? A Madagascar, he sounds so different. He really sounds so different, especially since he sang that song live on the VMAs uh, that year, in, uh, or at least in 2002. So it was just, it was different. It was a lot to comp- really peel away. But wasn't that bizarre, though? Just not to interrupt, but when he sang that song on the VMAs, right? I mean, he's got three songs to play. And of course, there's Jungle and Paradise City, but Madagascar gets stuck in the middle as a fan. I, I, I couldn't know understand what? the decision. Was that when he had the cornrows? That's when he had the cornrows. Yeah. <laughs> it was yeah. the first time you'd seen him in years. Yeah. Why? I didn't know what the song was. Nobody did. And you, you assume at that time, you know, I guess if he, he spoke to Kurt Loder, they were supposed to, I mean, they did tour. You know, they were going to happen. And I was lucky enough, I guess, uh, that was my my first Guns N' Roses concert was 2002 at Madison Square Garden. So it was, you know, a few months after uh, that tour. And then, uh, Chris, I don't know if you were living in Philly at the time. They were supposed to play there, and now it didn't happen. And the whole mm. tour was uh, canceled. We wouldn't hear from them again for many years. Oh, yeah. So it goes, the story of GNR. Crazy. Well, they did get back together, obviously, in 2016. I saw them, I think, is it two or three times I've seen that tour? And I still think they sound pretty good. I don't know what you guys think, but I I love it. As And I like hearing all the songs, like the Illusion, the Appetite, Mix in a few of the Chinese democracy songs, like it's I, it, the covers. Yeah, it is interesting. They they do all these other covers that they've never recorded, but it's cool here. I think the band sounds great. Personally, I I'm looking forward to a new album and a new tour. I hope we get both at some point. Agreed. Yeah, uh, I, I think they do. They do sound great. I mean, I, I I didn't have that feeling before. I'm like, I'm gonna see Axl Rose and Slash on stage together for the first time, and I I'm in the nosebleeds, but I still felt it. I'm like, oh wow, this is just, this is something else, and yeah, the, the covers sometimes I think are are great. Actually, sometimes I think the nod to Chris Cornell was uh, yeah, that was cool, and really great. Uh, although, I mean, I would love to hear like different Soundgarden songs. I feel like his his pocket would be you know cool. Mm-hmm. That's, a whole, that's a nerd thing. Yeah, uh, some of the more album it, tracks or something, something more obscure. Yeah, yeah. but even uh, I don't know why I love their version of uh, Glenn Campbell. Uh, Wichita lineman. I think that's so good. I hope I hope that is recorded and that's on the new record. That's how I feel about it. Okay. Uh, okay. So it's great. And I also I don't know about you guys. I'm I got to experience Axel DC, and that was phenomenal. And I was very lucky to be a, kind of a, up close for that and to see Axel up close and he nailed everything. So he's he really out there. he's out there. I mean he's proving all the doubters wrong. I, I just hope uh you know that continues. You know, as mm-hmm. he can, you know, he's making friends with all, you know, he's friends with Dave Grohl now. Every, everyone's, you know, he's, he's kissing babies, shaking hands. <laughs> <laughs> so, what, okay. So, let's do your yeah. final rankings. So, for the albums, I've got uh, number six, Spaghetti Incident, five, GNR Lies, four, Chinese Democracy, three, Use Your Illusion, two, uh, number two, Use Your Illusion, one, and then the number one for me is Appetite. I can mess around with the bottom few, uh, depending upon the day. Okay. I, I yeah. So what would you, you got to give me something. I mean, the first, I always do this and I'm cheating. You can tell me it's your, <laughs> your show. It's your rule. I can't count Use Your Illusion 1 and 2 as one experience. I can't count that as one. That's Those are two albums. Yeah, you got to do two separate albums. I know. All right. All right. Don't find the tight ship. All right. So uh, Appetite number one. You gotta, it's, it is what it is. You know, uh, the sky is blue. It is what it is. <laughs> Water it's a masterpiece. Back. And I, I got to go use your illusion one because November rain is my favorite song. It is, even though there are times I will, 
I, I really do love putting on Use Your Illusion 2 mm-hmm. instead. Stop it at, uh, before the last track in my world. And that's it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, three. Whew, that's, that's a tough one. Is I could go Chinese. It sounds like I'm ordering dinner now. But, <laughs> or, or Chinese or spaghetti. I know spaghetti probably. Even though I, I do feel, uh, I, I do feel it's underrated. That's probably last for me. Okay. Uh, Chinese and lies. I think they're. I, I love the acoustic GNR. I think that's something I would love for them to do. Is more acoustic stuff. I, it's a band. Assuming they they tour more or they do what uh, the Foo Fighters did a few years ago where they do an electric set and then acoustic set in the middle of the whole concert of the end of it. Hmm. Acoustic, I think they're they're a brilliant band. So uh, that's, that's, I do like Gene. Or, uh, well, it's not just because I have the hat, but you know, I, I do like the, the record. Yeah, no, I think they do sound good despite acoustic not too. Being real, like, despite the fake uh, crowd noise and all that stuff. Right, yeah, yeah. All right, Chris, what do you got? Oh, it's anticlimactic, right? I mean, going from, from first to, to worst, I'll go Appetite for Destruction. Uh, I prefer Usual Illusion 1 over Usual Illusion 2, although I think, you know, the, You Can Be Mine is the strongest song on both sets. That's on two. Mm-hmm. I think one is the more consistent album. Uh, so I'll go Usual Illusion 1, then Usual Illusion 2, then GNR Lies, then The Spaghetti Incident. And I'm sorry uh, for fans, uh, Chinese Democracy uh, comes in last on my list. Uh, that's not to say I don't recognize it for an amazing accomplishment. I think Brenda's right. I mean, you listen to some of those songs, but the texture and the complexity and some of the melodies and definitely the guitar work, there's some amazing stuff in there. Uh, you know, I, I think I just have to keep going back to the well. Maybe maybe I'm too dumb to get it yet, but maybe uh, certainly something to aspire to. But yeah, I've seen you know the band recently several times, and I, I think they're playing fantastic. Uh, absolutely fantastic. I think what they're doing is amazing. They're still going out there and they're playing for, for three hours. And to your point, I could probably do without the cover songs as well. Uh, I could certainly do without, you know, Sorry being in the set or some of the other Chinese democracy songs. Uh, you know, from my, my, this fan's opinion, uh, you know, there's no room for those songs unless you've played Appetite front to back already, the whole thing, then you can play whatever you want. But I'm also the same idiot that, you know, goes to a Vince Neil solo show and begs him to play anything off Exposed, whereas most people just want to hear the Motley Crue songs. I, I'm good. with you on that. I love that album, too. I know that's I, I'm a hair, I'm a hair metal nerd, too. So. Well, so so then the future. So what we do, we hear they are working on some albums. Maybe would Izzy be coming back? Like what happened to Izzy? Because could, could one of us get Izzy on his podcast? Because that would be a great episode, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. we all know his quote, right? You're working on it, Brando. That's not. It's like I'm, I'm like in theory, not really. It's not. I don't want that to get out there. I mean, like we all are working on it, quote unquote, trying to get Izzy. Right. But I mean, the closest I've gotten are people who talk to him. <laughs> you know what I mean? Okay. Like, yeah. Cause I'm thinking like, I mean, I'm on like this close to like, what if I, I, I think about this all the time. Like, what if I hired a private detective to track him? I mean, I literally have no idea where he is. Like I, it's like, it's they fascinating. Find him, head for the motorcycle repair shop. He's and then just ahead. like happen to like, just be in the same like area that he, or store that he goes to or whatever. <laughs> I'm yeah, sure that I would go over real well. <laughs> I believe he's in LA. He's just riding motorcycles. Just, you know, chilling. You know, he's just, just hanging out. I, I know Alan Niven, uh, who's maybe towards the beginning of the, the tour, you know, when I already got kicked off, he said on the, my podcast uh, that he was involved. Like he said, he showed up at a sound check. I think the word sound check may be, in, uh, that's leaves room to be interpreted because I don't think he like showed up to play necessarily at that moment, mm. but he did show up and for whatever reason, uh, you know, flew back home. But yeah, and then he tweeted out the, you know, they didn't split the money. Right. Uh, the, the 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 from him. Yeah. I mean, he, uh, it, it's a joke amongst uh, the, the GNR fans that he tweets uh, twice a year. Uh, <laughs> thank you for the birthday wishes, which he did recently. Yeah. And uh, happy holidays or something like that. That's mm. usually what he, he he does. So he's alive. Oh, he's that's there. Good. Yeah, I think it, almost a dozen solo records now. I mean, the guy's active. He hasn't had yeah. a solo record in like 12, 13 years or something though. I think if anything, I'd like to just see him in the songwriting uh, help. If he could just help, you know, write some of the songs. Like imagine if the whole band wrote and recorded like even like five songs together. Wouldn't that be amazing? Like you would get Adler back too, just to, just for like five songs. It'd be amazing. Of course. Uh, the only thing I can go by, and this is kind of like the, along the same lines of Axl Rose saying uh, Chinese democracy is, is going to come out soon. Uh <laughs> I was talking to Susan Holmes McKagan and she was uh, you know, Duff's wife and she was promoting her 
her book and then, you know, 50 minutes into the interview, I'm not asking her about new music. That's just not my style. I mean, who is she going to know about the new Guns N' Roses music? Cause she's married to a member, but she's like, Oh, I've heard some new GNR stuff. Uh, they've been fastidiously uh, working on, on some new music. And I've heard some bit of bits and boops or however she phrased it. You know, I can't give too detailed, but I've heard it and it's epic. And that was like a year and a half ago, two years ago. And I don't even know what she heard. She may have heard, you know, a, a Chinese democracy leak. So something's happening. It's just with this band, you just don't know. You're not going to get a press release. You know, when Chinese democracy uh, comes out, they're not going to do press. This is why they are a special band that we still talk about today. Because, the, you know, they're frustrating, but they back it up whenever they deliver, whenever they show up. It's it's, uh, it's something else. Yeah, I'm excited, especially to, to have Slash, back in the, Slash and Duff back in the fold. I think we will get a little bit more of that early sound as opposed to the full Chinese democracy, you know, maybe like a splash of that, but uh, it'd be interesting to hear what, if they do do something with, with slash and Duff and, and maybe even Izzy and Adler, I think that would be amazing. So awesome guys. Well, thank, this has been a lot of fun. I do like to end each episode with a charity. Um, Chris, I know you uh, work with the humane society of, is it North Carolina? Is that right? No. Humane Society of Charlotte. Yes. Wonderful organization. Please help pets if you can. Okay. So I'll put that in the notes and then Brando, okay. is there, is there a charity that you want to support here at the end? I'll just mention uh, just personally, anything that supports, uh, you know, helping people get mental health access is, is super important to me. But I guess also what I mentioned, because my fiance is here making me dinner, that she's a dance teacher and she works for Autism Speaks. Okay. So that's, a, that's an important charity. So Okay. You know, I'll I, put that in the notes as well. Well, thanks, guys. It's been a lot of fun and I'll get this episode out soon. Thanks, man. Thanks, Chuck. All right. Thanks, Good to be with you, Brenda. All right. See okay. you guys later. Bye. Bye-bye. Ah, so fun to talk Guns N' Roses, especially with two people so knowledgeable and cool. Thank you to Brando, and make sure to check out his podcast, Appetite for Distortion. He's had some great guests on there. And also thank you to Christopher P. Hilton, author of The Rise, Fall, and Rebirth of Hair Metal. Uh, we cover his book in depth on episode 126. So make sure to check that out, and you can order the book on Amazon. The link is in the show notes, along with everything else we've discussed. Thank you all for listening. Uh, if you really want to support the podcast, you can like, share, or comment stuff on social media or YouTube. That will help me out. Also, uh, I've been getting some great feedback lately from people who are reaching out and telling me that they just discovered the podcast and that they're loving it and they're going back and they're listening to old episodes. So I'm extremely grateful to hear that. And I love when anyone reaches out to tell me they enjoyed anything I do. And I try to do that with any podcast that I listen to or just anytime I appreciate anything anybody does. Uh, I think the world could use more of that right now. So I hope that uh, you tell somebody that you uh, appreciate what they did. That's a good thing to do. Have a great day, and remember to shoot for the moon. <laughs>